Welcome to Real Talk with Sarah. I'm your host, Sarah Roberts, and when it comes to our health, we can't overstate enough the importance of our mental health. Children are especially at risk, as it's not as easy for them to deal with crises and the pressures that we're facing at school, as well as manage their emotions the way adults can. With the advent of technology and social media, we're seeing new ways for our kids to be bullied, and suicide rates among our youth are alarming. In this episode, we're exploring our children's mental health, and I've got the Assistant Executive Director of Crossroads Mental Health Center, Natasha McBrearty, with me to help us unpack the topic and share the latest research. Then we'll meet Dania Versailles, Director of the Clinical Services with the Canadian Mental Health Association, talking to us about screen addiction and how we can better support our kids and strike a balance where technology is concerned. And later, we'll have registered psychotherapist John McKnight from the Youth Services Bureau of Ottawa to share his thoughts on ways to lower rates of teen suicide and the issues underlying our kids' experience with depression, loneliness, and despair so that we can better understand and support our young people. It's a big show, so let's get to it. Episode 22 of Real Talk with Sarah starts right now. When it comes to our kids, we can often focus on the behavior and not the underlying causes of the behavior. But when we're talking about their mental health, going below the surface is what's needed if we're going to help them understand their struggles and challenges and so we can support them better. Here with some real strategies to help us navigate these waters is the Assistant Executive Director of Crossroads Mental Health Center, Natasha McBrearty. Welcome, Natasha. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad that you're here. This is not an easy topic to mm -hmm. talk about. I think parents don't know where to begin. I think teachers don't know how to deal a lot of the times when they might be seeing things. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about behavior, because I think it's often like, the behavior is what we're looking at, but we need to go underneath that behavior. So what are some of the behaviors that you see parents bringing their kids in um, at Crossroads? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we see a whole range of behavior. Is um, really what it boils down to is any behavior that you know the parent identifies as problematic. So it could be anything from you know siblings fighting to biting to um, withdrawal or anxiety. Um, I think any time a parent is concerned about their child, I think it's a valid um, reason to seek help. Yeah, and so at Crossroads, what's amazing, I did not realize that this was even available. These are free resources that you provide to families who are struggling. Yeah, so we provide services for children with complex mental health needs from birth to the age of 12, but we're also open. We have a walk-in clinic that runs twice a week uh, for any family who has any mental health concern. Or, you know, when we talk about mental health, we're really talking about behavior, uh, behavioral concern, social concern, emotional concern. So anything that they might be worried about, uh, they can come in, speak with a mental health professional and get uh, help right in that moment. Uh, about the concern that they're bringing forward. So we've kind of touched on behavioral. Mm -hmm. Talk about the others. Yeah, so I guess behavioral is really, as you said, like really the tip of the iceberg. It's what we see. And especially with young children, that's, that's really how they communicate. That's how we see what's going on. And I think when you focus on the behavior, it's kind of, it's a bit of a, a dead end, right? You're focused on extinguishing that behavior, stopping it or changing it. Whereas when you look at what's underneath the concerns that they might have, it really opens up a whole range of, of solutions. So, um, you know, thinking about this, you know, thinking of maybe about siblings fighting, for example, you could really focus on the behavior, tell, you know, cut it out, that's it, you know, and, and really get kind of get stuck on mediating the conflict as opposed to really empathizing with your children or your child and trying to uncover what's driving the conflict or what's driving the behavior. Um, I know when we worked with one little guy, when we kind of got underneath, it was really that he was worried about his brother and that was coming out into, you know, fights or or disagreements and and I think had we focused on the fighting and tried to like get them to use their words and all the things we typically do with kids without really trying to understand what's happening underneath we would have missed that opportunity to reassure him or to talk about safety or to talk about the worries he has about his brother so how we understand the behavior really guides how we approach it and how we address it wow how eye-opening for that family mm -hmm. and how healing for those children yeah so what was the protocol there what how how did you approach that situation using that example? 
Yeah, so we, I mean, we really just try to meet children and their families where they're at. So, uh, like I said, there's really no behavior uh, that that's sort of red flag. I mean, there are, of course, behaviors that are a bit of a red flag, but I think anything that we see as, you know, severe or frequent or worrisome um, or that's affecting the child in many areas of their life would be something that we definitely want to unpack with a family. And really, we believe that children and families are the experts on, on what's going on in the their family and so <clears throat> a lot of what we do is meeting them where they're at trying to uncover their resources their expertise about their family building on those strengths and then helping them discover solutions or mobilize solutions that they already have and put them into practice so when you work with families is there a structured protocol or is everyone that comes in is a completely unique case and some people are you using puppets are you using like I, I would love to understand so in terms a bit better. of treatment yeah, yeah. so I guess there's sort of a, a few different ways to answer that question. Uh, it is very individualized, as you said, because there really is no si one size fits all. Right. Um, and we also want to make sure that the work that we're doing together is productive. So we would really want to, uh, again, understand the family's concerns and then develop a treatment plan that's going to really address their needs. And I think where that's so important is in making sure that the solutions that we come up together uh, are, are doable for the family, that they're relevant, and that the family actually buys into it, that they believe that that's going to be a fix for their family. Family. So you can tell me, you know, establish a behavior modification chart and give your kid a sticker every time he, I don't know, makes his bed. But if I don't really care about beds being made and I don't have the, you know, there's so much going on that I can't follow through with giving those stickers consistently, that's just not going to work in my family culture. So that's what we want to understand is what's your family culture? What's going to work for you? How can we help you mobilize those resources and support you in achieving your goals? Yeah, mm -hmm. it sounds extremely comprehensive and I, I imagine it feels that way when you're working with a family. You mentioned about the social mm -hmm. issues that, that children can go through. So what do those look like? So we know behavior is sort of kicking, biting, punching, scratching, you know, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, what are the social um, cues that you're seeing with, with children that are suffering with their mental health? Yeah, I think you've identified a lot of them because those are uh, behaviors that come up when kids don't necessarily have uh, the skills that they need to interact in ways that are pro-social. And so what we're trying to do is um, build skills. And I think that's a big shift from how we've dealt with behavior in the past. I think conventionally we've either told kids to just stop it or yeah. we've given them rewards or punishments. And all of that assumes that they're just not motivated enough to behave in the way we want them to behave. And I think when you, you know, shift to, to new ways of thinking and, and we use collaborative problem solving as our model, what you're doing is looking at what are the skills that the child needs to build in order to meet the expectation. So it's no longer about motivating them or punishing them out of a behavior, but looking at does this child have the ability to self-regulate? Are they able to make friends and take other people's perspectives? Do they have the communication skills that they need to interact positively with others? And again, once you start to look at some of that, those skill building opportunities, it really opens up a range of possibilities in terms of how you address those issues. Yeah, how do they develop those skills? Is this stuff that you teach parents and then the parents help their child at home to keep practicing over time? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We do some of that. I think, you know, families, again, have so much expertise. So uh, I don't, you know, we do some teaching, but we really work with families to um, help them empathize with their child. So, you know, how can they show their child that they are really concerned? And, you know, the vast majority of families are caring and, you know, trying to connect with their child and empathize. Um, so it's really about reinforcing those, those skills. And I think, you know, and I am the first to blame, but when we're parenting and you've got you know so much going on you're dealing with your daily life to really sit down and be present or you know on the basketball court wherever you choose to do it but be present and intentional in your parenting uh, it doesn't always come easy it's hard work so I think it's you know being able to share that compassion with your child but also with yourself taking the time to empathize to really understand what's going on focusing on the relationship and then yes the problem solving skills were the, would be the piece where we you know we we use like i said the collaborative problem solving model so using those elements to to help your child come up with solutions that are going to be you know setting them up for success across you know whether it's at home or at school or in their social lives so you work with kids up until age 12 mm -hmm. the older ones sort of you know, 9 10 11 12 are they 
really collaborating with all of this? Are they listening in? Are they in the appointment? Are they full on a part of this whole experience? Or yeah. is it often just working with the parents and then they go home and and try to help the child? Yeah, that's a great question actually because I think we do a little bit of everything. Um, again, because it's really individualized, we, you know, early on uh, try to assess what's going to be most effective. Um, kids don't live alone. They don't, you know, they, they live within family systems and so I think that family involvement or that caregiver involvement, depending on who's involved, is, is so important. And what we want to do is coach that child and family through so that they can continue to practice the skills outside of the session. So uh, we do like to involve the family as much as possible. Now there are times where you know the child doesn't want to be in the session or the parent you know there, there can be all kinds of configurations depending on what the need is. I have to say though that when a child feels heard and validated and that their concerns matter even if they came out kind of pouty and not wanting to be there by the end of the session a lot of them are really happy to be there and leave feeling hopeful. Isn't that rewarding? It really is. I can only imagine how that must feel, and it's so true. I mean, if all of us, I think, are starting to wake up to our emotional needs mm -hmm. and looking to our children, and not just that children are seen and not heard, and, and you know, treating them that way, yeah. but really treating them as individuals that they are with their own set of emotions. Absolutely. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy that you do this work at Crossroads. So tell us a little bit more about Crossroads. So you work with kids from up till 12 years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we have a whole range of programs. So we work uh, in the home, so some families uh, do... Um, uh, require or ask for support in terms of parenting strategies so that could be anything from setting routines or helping them uh, lay out their expectations doing the problem solving in the context where the problems are happening uh, we also work in schools so we have um, 10 schools with a Catholic and public board that we're working with where uh, children are identified and get to meet with uh, mental health counselors to address issues that would be related to school uh, we're working with some daycares or some child care centers in the city uh, and I think what's exciting for me is that you know we haven't talked about children's mental health a whole lot I think recently we're gaining such an understanding from the new research and literature that's come out about how early we can you know identify mental health concerns and then you know the great benefit that can happen when you address them early so when we're targeting children in child care centers as young as two three and four we know that the impact that that intervention has had can potentially last a lifetime so it's amazing Think about the foundation that you're creating for mm -hmm. these children. Beautiful. All right, more with Natasha when we come back. Back in a moment. If you're just joining us, we're talking about mental health in our youth on this show. And I've got Natasha McBreerty from Crossroads Mental Health Center helping us understand this issue better. So let's talk about things that parents can do if they, um, well, actually, let's start with what are some signs that parents can be looking for if they're not even aware that there are any mental health issues with their child? What are some signs that might indicate that there is an issue? Mm -hmm. So in little ones, again, often we see it through behaviors. So, um, you know, I think what we want to be looking for is four things. So if there's behaviors that are concerning to you, uh, it's important to look at the severity. So what is happening? So a really extreme example might be headbanging. Like if it's, is it happening a lot? It, you know, is it really hard? Are you worried about their physical health? You know, so it's, it's looking at the severity of the behavior and sort of doing a bit of an analysis there. Um, the frequency of the behaviors. So, you know, we all worry from time to time and that's just sort of, you know, normal. <laughs> Part of life, yeah, but yes. yeah, part of life. Um, yeah. But if your child is, you know, really worried and can't fall asleep, and and you know the worry is continuing, uh, you know, for a long time, or, or you know, is worrisome to you, then that's something that you would want to pay attention to. Um, the other is the intensity. So if the worry is sort of mild and comes and goes, and they're maybe worried about gymnastics, but not so much about school, you might not really uh, react to that as much. If is that worry really intense, and is it, you know? 
kids are having tummy aches and throwing up. And so, so that's another thing that you'd want to pay attention to. And then finally is going back to the gymnastics and school examples. So if it's happening across all the different or, or some of the different domains in their life. So for example, uh, they're worried at school, they're worried, worried in their extracurriculars, they're worried at home, and it seems to be pervasive, then that's also a sign that something is going on. Do you feel like kids today are more worried about their life than I just feel like I was not worried mm -hmm. as a child, and, and I'm, I, that's a blanket, you know. I, I'm just wondering if you feel that today kids seem to have more to worry about. Yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of different things that kids are worried about. And I think that, you know, there's been lots of talk about how technology and different things are, you know, creating more stress in children. Mm -hmm. um, the research isn't necessarily confirming that. I think that we're all becoming a lot more aware about mental health issues, anxiety uh, in particular. Uh, and so, you know, I think because of some of these campaigns to destigmatize and to talk about mental health, people are seeking help more frequently. So at Crossroads, where I work, we've seen a huge increase in the number. It's almost doubled since 2007, or sorry, 2017 in terms of the numbers of calls we've gotten um, requesting services for children. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's been an increase in mental health problems, but certainly people are identifying it. Uh, earlier and they're they're reaching out for help how encouraging mm -hmm. to know that these campaigns are working like you're at the grassroots level you're at the ground floor you can see that the bell let's talk and these you know all of these other initiatives and just more and more of us being more open about our struggles mm -hmm. I think it's only going to improve the landscape and and, the, and open up the conversation, the dialogue even more. Yeah, and I think, you know, thanks to shows like this, I think we are talking about it more and I think we need to continue to talk about it because I think we've traveled some of the way, but there's certainly a lot more that we can do. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and again, I really, I'm, I'm stuck on that th that topic that you shared on in the first segment on the emotional landscape of the child. I think just really paying attention mm -hmm. when kids feel heard and they feel like their feelings matter mm -hmm. and when parents really try to put words to those feelings and Absolutely. to not just sort of let the kid just try to process on their own mm -hmm. it can really make a difference yeah yeah I think you know especially with little ones where you know we're apt to say things like oh you're just tired or oh you must be hungry or here's what you need and you know to really stop and hear what's going on and to your point help put words to some of the feelings that they're experiencing can be so helpful and it also gives them a feeling vocabulary so that they're better able to express themselves moving forward um, we often like to talk about the three R's which are you know relationship regulate and reason and so relationships regulate and reason yeah okay, relationships so relationships that's kind of the the precursor the 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 foundation to any intervention with your child so or not even intervention but just the relationship is sort of key anything that that you are trying to get your child to do <laughs> whether it's homework or you know whatever really when you have that foundation of a relationship to build on it that really sets both of you uh, up for success and how do parents build that relationship yeah so I think it's the small things you know when we talked a little bit about empathy in the first segment but you know, being able to just take that time to connect with your child and to do what matters to them. And, you know, again, and, and I'll speak from my own experience, you know, we have things to do like grocery shopping and everything else. And so you're carting your kids around, but, you know, kids, in, you know, they, they want to stop you and, and, you know, jump in a puddle or play leg or whatever. And, and that's not always what we feel like doing in that moment, right? But but being able to join them in the activities of their choosing and to, to share in some of their feeling and, you know, Empathy isn't about saying you're right, you know, like if a child is really angry about, you know, they can't watch a TV show, it's not that, oh, you know, like you're, you watch the TV show because I can see you're upset, but validating those feelings that like, oh, I can see you're really frustrated or I can see this is really hard for you or, and really going along with your but child. But you're still think, not watching TV. Oh, that's <laughs> right. You don't have to drop your expectation, but you can be empathetic and pursue your expectation at the same time, which is a skill that, you know, I think is a difficult one to master. Oh my gosh, I don't know how, I don't have my own children as most of my viewers know. I don't know how parents do this work and become sort of, 
I, I just feel like it's it's so multifaceted being a really good parent, mm -hmm. being available to your kids' emotional needs, physical needs, you know, social needs. I mean, absolutely, it's a ton of work, yeah. but obviously so rewarding when we can take those moments and really keep developing the relationship with our children. Absolutely. What was the next R? The next R is regulate. So I think this is one where, you know, when we see a problematic behavior, um, it's easy to get triggered or worried or, you know, upset. Um, so I trying to think of an example, but if, for example, a child is just refusing to do their homework and you're both kind of stuck in that mode of you're going to yeah. do it and yeah. it's due and you start taking some of that on and a lot of us feel the need to address it right then and there. Um, and I think that when we're both dysregulated, the child and the parent, you know, really solution, you, there's no, our brains are not, they're flooded. There's no way we're solving this in any kind of an effective way. And so giving yourself permission to take a step back and to sort of just check in with yourself and, and you know, do a bit of a, a reflection on it. You know, what is my expectation? What is the problem I'm trying to solve? Why is this important to me? And again, none of this is about changing your expectations, but it gives you a moment to be really intentional about your parenting. And what's the last R? The last R is reason. So that goes back to the problem solving piece. And so how do we engage our children in developing solutions with us? I think that, you know, the way many of us were brought up was sort of that do as I say, as you mentioned, <laughs> right? I like this so. is just the way it goes. Um, and, and while that can help the child meet your, you know, create a situation where the child is going to meet your need, they're really not learning a whole lot in the process. But when you can unpack that problem solving process with your child, they're learning really important skills about how to come up with solutions that are not only going to address their needs and concerns, but also take into account your needs. And those are the kinds of skills that they'll bring to all of their relationships. Yeah, I was going to say to, yeah. to work relationships, obviously in school, yeah. you know, to relate like marriage relationships exactly. down the road. Like, yeah. These are amazing skills that you're teaching. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Let's touch quickly. We have a few minutes left. Let's talk about bullying. Yeah. How would a parent maybe know that their child was being bullied? Are there some signs and signals that we can watch out for? Yeah, there's certainly some signs. I mean, again, it's really individual, and I think that's maybe the message that you know is is, is yeah. woven through everything that I'm speaking about. Yeah, because, you got to know your kid. Yeah, every child is going to experience it differently, and you know, you have some kids who will kind of externalize some of their worries or their behaviors or those you know the feelings that that are associated with bullying, and so you might see a lot of anger, a lot of lashing out, or maybe bullying you know their little brother or whatever that looks like. And then other kids might completely withdraw and become really anxious. So unfortunately, there's not that one behavior that you can look out for that says, I'm being bullied and pay attention. Maybe just a change in behavior then? Yeah, a yeah. change in behavior. Anything that deviates from you know what how you know your kid is definitely something to tune into. Um, but you know, if, if you have that relationship with your child and you are, you know, striving to you know, connect with them and listen to their concerns. I think, you know, often we're able to, to sort of pick at the surface until we, we kind of understand what's going on. And so again, it would be looking underneath the behaviors and maybe it's bullying, maybe it's, it's social issues, maybe it's something going on that's sort of driving the behavior that you're seeing on the outside. You've got about 30 seconds to a minute left. Tell me where you're really excited to see things going in your work. Yeah, I, well, I'm really excited that people are talking about it, like I said. I'm also so exciting that, excited that we're paying attention to infant and early childhood mental health because you know, those attachment pieces early on in life, the early intervention and identification, those are the, the, the interventions that are going to have the biggest bang for a buck in terms of supporting people, not only in their childhood, but across their life, building the skills that they're going to need to be successful. Mm -hmm. Building those skills. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about, right? From the ground floor, from the time they're young. We don't teach people when they're 40 how to deal with their emotions. We, you know, it's so much better to do well, it early. Well, our brains have great plasticity, so there's hope for 40-year-olds too. Absolutely. But definitely our little ones are very open to change. and. Thank you so much for being here with me. You're yeah. amazing, and thank, thank you for you. all the amazing work you're doing. Thanks for and having me. And you've really me. helped a lot of parents tonight. We have to take a break, but when we come back, we're going to talk with Dania Versailles of the Canadian Mental Health Association to share her thoughts on helping our kids avoid or heal from technology addiction. Back in a moment.
Welcome back to Real Talk with Sarah. If you're just joining us, we're talking about our kids' mental health on this show. And with the pervasiveness of technology, we're seeing dramatic increases in our children's use of smartphones, social media, texting, and gaming. I'm delighted to welcome my next guest to dig into this topic from the Canadian Mental Health Association, Dania Versailles. Welcome, Dania. Thank you. It's, it's Tanya with a D. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming on to talk about this. I know so many parents who are saying to me, Sarah, you just don't get it. You're not a parent. You don't understand. Technology is a thing. It's crazy. They're always on it. They're addicted to it. Mm -hmm. um, parents really struggling with how much do I allow? How much do I not allow? It's a whole new ball of wax that you know parents from before didn't have to deal with. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, technological devices, social media, it's everywhere yeah. where we work, live, play. It makes our lives, our lives easier. It facilitates the way we do groceries, even for seniors. It facilitates the way we provide help for uh, victims of the road or the way we want to register our kids for a Taekwondo or, or adhere to a specific social program. It's omnipresent. It's here to stay. Yeah, I was going to say, and it's not going anywhere. It's not going no. anywhere. Yeah. And parents have to learn ways that they didn't see modeling yeah. uh, by their parents or their grandparents on how to coexist, coexist with all of these. So you don't see it um, as sort of the same thing as parents putting children in front of Sesame Street in the 70s and 80s and mm -hmm. 90s. This is a whole different ball of wax. It is, it yeah. is, and it's in school, and school is encouraged to use them. I mean, they, they, they have all this equipment that they have to, so they can, they can learn things. It's good, but with all in balance. Mm -hmm. And therein lies the importance for parents to establish healthy boundaries. Mm -hmm. yeah. Healthy boundaries with technology. Exactly. That's the, that's the deal. And of course, I guess every parent is going to have those healthy boundaries that are going to be different. Absolutely. You know, and I guess that's part of being a parent. You get to decide what's healthy boundaries in your case. It is. And yeah. so, you know, we're raised by we were raised by boundaries we we were we faced when we grew up. And and um, there comes a times when you're a parent, you have to decide, okay, well, I'm going to raise my children this way or that way. But now, technology is so we're so surrounded by it that it's maybe a good time to renegotiate those boundaries as the child grows, of course, but and also by reminding parents or re, for parents to remind their teenagers that as a parent, I have a role to nurture you, to love you, to protect your 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 well-being, and to establish some safeguards. Because, like I said before, if it's used in excess, social media or technological devices can be harmful to, to children mm -hmm. to their growth. Harmful to their growth in what way? Well, um, it can um, it can grab their attention away from what the the basic daily living activities, such as sleep, which is really important for the brain during you know those magic magical years of ten to twenty years. Um, it can also uh, affect their physical activity. I mean, look at our parks. Oh my gosh! Some parks are okay. Yes, you see kids, but how many more parks you, you don't see kids playing anymore outdoors? It's unbelievable. It is. It is. Yeah. And so, and also, um, when research is showing that um, if when the child spends a lot of time in front of screens, be it smartphones, TV, or or video games, um, it may affect also the way um, the quality of their nutrition. Mm -hmm. Because now they revert back to finger foods, these you know things that are easy to to drink and be, and so it removes the awareness yep. of a situation, and so it's 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 easier to to eat whatever you can grab fast and quick that you don't have to cook or mix, um, in that way in that way it can be harmful. And we see that in adults, right? We're you know on our tech with one and eating with another completely mindlessly. Wow. Exactly, and Talk so it's important to be persistent and consistent. Mm -hmm. And so you're referring to adults. We have to role model these yes. behaviors yes. that we want our children to yeah. to, to emulate. We can't or, be saying get off the phone and we're on the phone. Well, exactly. And there are some situations because of work or because of family needs that yes, okay, it requires the adult to to um, bend a little bit um, with their rules. However, um, by being persistent and consistent in our own behavior, we don't dilute the message that mm -hmm. we convey to our teenagers, mm -hmm. and we we and our messages become more credible 
as well. Yes, well said. Yes, and if and if it comes from a place of love and nature, nurturing, and uh, with the understanding that you know, mommy and daddy are are wanting to safeguard you from some some uh, risks that you may not see, and so. They're so invested. opening up yeah. that dialogue. Exactly. Yeah. I was just going to say that dialogue is an absolute must mm -hmm. and important. And again, like we said earlier, we have to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. I mean, I'll take me as an, as an example. Um, up to recently, I was not very comfortable with social, social media or some technological devices, and I, I'm still not. But once I recognize that, um, I can decide, well, you know what, kiddo, why not you teach mommy how to use that? Neat. Um, and then you um, open the grounds for an open and honest dialogue. Um, you promote um, the opportunity for your child to practice leadership skills and coaching skills, which will be useful when uh, they grow later on. And then you're starting to see what kind of adult you're shaping. Yes learning side by side wow. you know, with the children. Well, you've brought some amazing tips, and I know we're, we're touching on a few of them, but let's go through them um, you know, one by one. So the first one is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yes. So dig in a little deeper to that one. So as parents, we're used to having all the answers, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, not so much with, with uh, technology, um, and to the extent that we're using technology. And so it's okay to say, you know what, mommy or daddy, I don't have the answer. We don't have the answer for that now, but let's let's find out mm -hmm. and let's do a little bit of research or let's let's um, share this journey together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and tell me what you know. Tell me what you know about this or or the other. Or um, if it's a situation that was brought upon by a friend or uh, what a friend's parent allows that friend right. to do, yeah. then okay, well, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. So again, just having this open conversation that's really honest and real. Yes. All right, what's the second tip? I've got be consistent and uh, persistent. So exactly, so that refers back to um, being a great uh, role model. It doesn't have to, we don't have to be perfect role models. Right. Okay? But we, we still do have to make um, extra effort to show the behavior that we want them to um, to enact. Okay. Yeah. And then establish and negotiate boundaries. So boundaries, again, so that uh, speaks to the disciplinarian role of, uh, of parents. And depending on our culture or the way we were raised, discipline can show, can be shown in, in different ways, right? But the important thing really is to understand that when we apply discipline, um, discipline is good, it's got there's foundations and bases there's merit for that. To it, yeah. Exactly, merit to it. Mm -hmm. However, if we become so rigid, we can snap, and so, and so. Like we as parents, or we as kids. Both. 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 <laughs> yeah, sure. We can each snap, snap in our own corners, but also the relationship that we have with our children can snap. And for that moment, how far ahead are you if you let that happen? You know, and and then again, be comfortable with the uncomfortable. So we snapped. Let's get back to work. Let's get back to square one and start again. We're learning. It's a journey that we can share together. I really am appreciating this approach of the parent-child working together to come mm -hmm. up with solutions that are reasonable, that are actionable, that are doable, yes. that are realistic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, what's your other tip? Let me look here. Intimidation works both ways. What do you mean by that? So what I mean by that is that, again, if discipline is taken to... Um, far to the other uh, spectrum. Like if we're saying no cell phones at all until you're 22 years old and you know you cannot use it, you know. Uh, you know how far will we go with that? Right. Not very far. Yeah. Um, but and so we have to be a little soft at the edges and and agree to um, revisit, to review uh, some boundaries. Let's say, let's talk about a family dinner. Okay, everybody knows the way I grew up and the way most of my, my friends grew up where family dinner was sacred. Everybody shows up and, and we talk and we share what, we, you know, what happened during the day. Well, nowadays, you know, we're on our devices or ping and we, we bring our, it brings our attention away for, for a number of, uh, of minutes. Yeah. And so we can establish new family rules or fam family media rules and say, okay, well, during family uh, dinner, it's a no phone zone, and we decide to recharge our, 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 our devices, or yeah. we decide to, uh, to um, upload some new applications, whatever. And on top of that, we remove them away from 
the kitchen table mm -hmm. from the, 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 the kitchen. Out of sight. Out of sight. I like that a lot. Yeah. All right, and your last that. tip is about replacing the void with pleasurable activities. And so before we had all these devices, we had fun. Yeah. You know, and... Real and, fun. Well, you know. Yeah. Fun is fun. Yeah. And so um, whenever a device is used to the excess, it brings pleasure, obviously, and that's why it's used to the excess, because it's, it's, it's nice to have like me and so many likes all the time. But if we remove that or limit the um, use of that device significantly, replace it with something that the child used to have fun with, or that families, um, um, with family activities to create new, uh, you know, great memories. Go to the festival, uh, organize a party, um, have, do exercise together, do yoga, mindfulness exercises, go to the forest, go in the, in the nature, um, you know. And so that could be part of the family rules and the new family media plan where we, you, we list everything that you like to do, you like to do, you like to do. And then we come to an agreement on okay, during this t portion of the time, during the day or during the week or during the month, let's agree that for a chunk of that time, we're removing devices and uh, we jump into Amazing, Dania. Thank you so much for being here. When we come back, I will have John McKnight from the Youth Services Bureau of Ottawa to talk about teen suicide. Back in a moment. If you're just joining us, we're talking about mental health in our youth on this show, and I've asked John McKnight from the Youth Services Bureau of Ottawa to share with us about the issue of teen suicide. Welcome, John. Thank you for having me, Sarah. Thank you for coming on to talk about something that I think is a topic a lot of people shy away from. We're scared to talk about it. We don't know where to start. I read a statistic recently that uh, teen suicide is the second leading cause of death among our youth. What are the trends that you're seeing right now? Yeah, so certainly a difficult topic to talk about and um, one that we pay close attention to over Youth Services Bureau. Um, you know, some trends that we're seeing that, that are encouraging um, is, in fact, over the last five years um, in Ottawa, we have seen some stabilization um, in the rates uh, of suicide. Okay, so they haven't uh, gone up, they haven't gone down. That's right. So, so actually some slight decreases, which is which is encouraging. Okay. Um, and, and we're also seeing trend-wise um, more people, so an increase we're seeing is people accessing services. Yes. Um, to let people know, professionals know, family know that I'm dealing with uh, some mental health issues, I'm dealing with some risk factors, uh, and suicide is something that I've been thinking about and I need help. So that's very encouraging. It's not to say that um, that our work is done and knowing that there's some stabilization. Um, you know, in fact, uh, most recently when we did uh, this study is um, we learned that um, over half of the young people who had uh, in the, over the last year who had identified that they had been thinking about completing suicide also identified that they wanted to talk about it, but they didn't know where to go. Wow. So our work's not done. I think it's still really important to use that information to remind us that we need to be active in uh, learning about the resources in our community, learning about what's available, so that if we do come in contact with a young person or anybody that uh, has been thinking about suicide or needs support, that we know how to support them in accessing that and we can let them know um, how to do so. Amazing. I'm so yeah. glad that you're, that you're in the community, that you are here for our children, and that these are free resources Absolutely, that yeah. they have access to. And I know that we're not speaking to just people in the Ottawa area, but I think in lots of areas, if we dig a little bit, we can find some of these community resources that can support us. Certainly can, yeah. 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 So what are some of the risk factors when it comes to teen suicide that are commonly you know, coming up in your work? Yeah, so, so risk factors are, are those really important things for us to be paying attention to because those are the opportunities that when we notice them, um, we can reach out to that young person and check in if they need help um, and support them in accessing that help. Um, I think when we talk about suicide, it's important to acknowledge that it's a very complex um, topic. It's a very complex um, issue. Um, and so when we talk about risk factors, we're, we acknowledge that it's not one risk factor necessarily that would dictate whether a young person predict whether they're at risk for 
suicide or, um, or, or that uh, if a suicide does happen, that one factor in and of itself would explain a suicide. But risk factors that we tend to pay attention to and uh, examples of those would be um, if the young person has a, a family history, so somebody within the family or known to them in their life has completed suicide, if they've had a previous attempt, um, if they're experiencing some significant uh, family conflict, family breakdown, um, if they're expressing things such as hopelessness, we want to be paying really close attention to these types of things to prompt us to check in with these individuals and let them know that there is help. When so this is stuff parents can be really watching out for them. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. When we're when we're thinking about risk factors, we also want to be thinking about protective factors. Um, so protective factors are those things that are really going to support a young person in being able to deal with some of those adverse situations that might be putting them at risk. So protective factors uh, for parents can include a really strong, loving, caring relationship in the home. Like modeling um, between mom and dad. That's right. Yeah, okay. modeling between young mom and dad, developing that connection with that young person, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, protective factors can include um, a strong connection in the community, getting them connected to um, organized uh, activities, groups, things of that nature, um, developing and promoting uh, uh, strong peer support networks, healthy peer support networks for the young person. So really paying attention not just only for the risk factors, but promoting uh, protective factors to build that resilience and that person's ability to respond to those adverse situations. How amazing. And is this some of the work that you do at YSB then is helping the parents to teach the kids how to sort of regulate and do these things? It is, it is, yeah. yeah. So cer certainly um, uh, when, a, when a parent is coming into Youth Services Bureau um, and asking for support um, in the context of, uh, of suicide and or mental health, we want to be um, uh, expressing those things and putting an emphasis on those things to really help the parent um, go home and, and work with those things with the young person. Where are you feeling most encouraged? Yeah. On a day-to-day -day basis, where are you feeling like, with the work you're doing, we're really making some headway? So I think in the, in the self-identifying from young people, yeah. I think that's really encouraging and really important. And it's telling us that if we make services available, um, young people, for the, for the most part, will, will come out to the services. Um, they'll, they'll identify if they feel safe, um, that they need support, that they need help, that they're at risk. Um, and and that, that really pre presents that opportunity for that early intervention yeah. as early as possible to promote positive outcomes. So that help-seeking behavior that we're seeing more and more of really important and really encouraging. That is amazing. And are you feeling like parents are encouraging the kids to make those calls? Or are these kids that are coming to you, their parents don't even know that they're going through this, and they're just coming to you as a first line of defense? Yeah, o oftentimes it's, uh, it's parents bringing in um, the young person, um, which, uh, which I think is ideal. And um, then we have the family there to work with, because mm -hmm. often that can be the most important piece is um, when we're in the room with the youth, we absolutely can do work with that youth. Um, and when we have contact with the whole family, if that's that's a possibility and an option, um, then we, we create that much, uh, we, we increase that opportunity for the young person to be able to go back into the home and, uh, and continue that progress that they have and that they've made in session. What do you suggest would be a great conversation starter for parents that maybe don't have a clue where to begin to talk about yeah. this? If they don't even, they don't see any behaviors that would make them think that there are any issues, but I know that sometimes there aren't any behaviors and yet our children are suffering. They're, they're struggling with their mental health, but maybe they're embarrassed to talk about it or they don't want to bring it up. Yeah. What would you suggest for parents? Yeah, so that parents coming in to ask, how do I talk to my young person about mental health and safety yeah. is, is a really common piece. We see that a lot when parents are reaching out for support. How do I have the conversation about mental health, about safety? Yeah. Um, and, and, and really in that, often that reluctance or, or even that feeling that this might be scary for a parent um, is, is often connected to a parent wondering, um, what if I don't say the right thing? Yeah, right? they might worry that they're going to turn it all around to That's the right. negative. Yeah. So maybe in a lot of ways, parents don't want to even start the conversation. It's kind of like the old days, we don't talk about sex, because if we don't talk about it, they won't do it. Right, <laughs> We right. realize that doesn't work. Yeah, and they, yeah. they might also be wondering, well, what, what if I don't have all of the answers? Okay. Yeah. In, in, the, in these uh, situations with parents, when there is a lot of hesitancy to go forward and have that conversation, um, I'm often encouraging parents to um, have that first question that they would ask for themselves. And, and, and that question really would be, do I need to be able to come across like an expert or sound 
like an expert to be able to talk to my child about mental health? And the answer is absolutely not. It's almost probably better to be totally not the expert. That's right. Right, yeah, just absolutely be real. Not. If your conversation with the young person includes ingredients such as caring, empathy, validation, working towards understanding, then you've created that opportunity for the young person to see, I'm being noticed and people care about me. Oh my gosh, I'm being noticed and people care about That's me. That's right. Yeah. Kind of like what Daniel was sharing, you know, just and and, um, and Natasha earlier on, Absolutely. really just acknowledging, honoring our children's feelings. Absolutely, and and it's and, and learning how to talk about mental health with your child is a process, yes. right? Let them in on that process. So during that process, allow them to teach you ways that work for them, right? As individuals, allow them to give you feedback on on how you're doing in that process. When it comes to talking about safety um, with your child really important to use that as an opportunity to let the young person know in our home it's not taboo to talk about suicide or safety we can do this together so in doing so you can be using words like suicide let them know it's okay to talk about it and use that such language talk about safety use words such as safety um, ask them direct questions have you been thinking about suicide this is what i've been noticing and this is what i'm seeing going on don't be afraid to use that type of language Wow, I think a lot of parents watching are going to think outright ask my child if they've been thinking about suicide. Yeah. But and, that's something positive to do. And that and that yeah, and that uh, and that really is connected to a myth that's been around for quite a long time. If I use that language around somebody, I'm going to plant that seed in their mind, right? That yeah. that idea now is exists because I used that language. Yeah. And that's just not the case, right? Mm -hmm. What you're really doing there is you're letting the person know we can talk about this and I'm comfortable talking about this. Yeah, we can talk about hard things because life is hard. That's right. Right? Yeah. And we can do this together. And I love that feeling of yeah. not being an expert as the parent. Absolutely, yeah. The, the other thing I would really encourage parents to be thinking about too um, uh, in regards to talking about mental health and or safety of suicide um, is that they're not alone. Right? Yeah. So at any point in time, if they feel like they're struggling with any of those conversations, if they feel like there's some urgency and safety is a, is a significant concern, reach out. Reach out to your local crisis line. Um, uh, before going into those conversations, if you know that this is the type of conversation that you want to be having, take a little bit of time, do a little bit of research, get to know what those resources are in the community so that when you have that conversation, if things aren't going well and you do need some additional support, you have that information readily available. That's gonna increase the young person's confidence in opening up to you and talking to you, and it's gonna increase that option for that ability to have that earlier intervention and address the issue sooner rather than later. Yeah, I think what you, you know, all of our my guests today, it's really that early intervention. It's those yes, early yeah. conversations. It's, again, not waiting until things come up to then start okay now what do I figure out how to do and I'm really impressed with all of these resources in our community that are yeah. available for our youth we are we are quite fortunate and it's making a difference it's making yeah. a huge difference as you said when we first started these rates are you know it's it's encouraging what we're seeing and kids coming in on their own volition amazing That's thank you true. so much for being with me my pleasure all right that was amazing I know you've helped a lot of parents tonight when we come back, I'll share my final thoughts. Back in a moment. Our brains and our bodies are totally connected. What we think affects how we feel, which influences the ways in which we behave. While adults may be able to get through a dark period or challenging life experience with greater resilience and learning a lesson from it, our children don't have the forward thinking skills of adults and they can tend to believe that the way they feel right now is the way they will always feel. When things are tough, kids can go inward, wondering if they're the only one in the world who feels the way they do. As parents and adults, it's imperative that we take notice and tend to our children's emotional needs or else behavioral issues, trouble in school or with the law, addiction, depression, suicide, and other side effects of poor mental health can be the unfortunate and even devastating result. Thank you to my guests Natasha McBrady, Dania Versailles, and John McKnight for shining a light on the issues our youth are facing and providing real strategies to help us support them better. Our youth are not our future. 
They are our now. And it is all of our responsibility to uplift and reassure them that no matter what they're facing, they aren't alone. Because, as you know, until next time, I want you to remember one thing, that no matter where you are and no matter how it feels, you are never, ever alone. See you next time.